Hello and welcome. Today we're going to be talking about sexuality and the family. The book opens up talking about all the intersectional facets that are associated with your identity. Again, so you have your gender identity, which is an assumption of what sex group you belong to and then the attributes that are attached to that and the socialized categorization of sexes into genders that can be defined as masculine, feminine, or a range in between, or you can look at gender as a multi-axis facet. Your book talks about sexuality and how that informs our identity, uh, race, socioeconomic status, culture, the socialization process, how we're taught to think, how we're taught to view the world. Uh, and then habitus, which is a sociological term that refers to your overall culture, your overall common way of life that's inclusive of all of these factors, because all of these factors are associated with your status in life and where you're located and your overall likes and dislikes, tastes and affinities, etc. So, the history of sexuality. So, when you're going to approach the subject of sexual, uh, sociology and sexuality, we have to get into the history of sexuality. And your book's doing a pretty good job of this by talking about the evolution of the family and then how that has changed over time. For example, historically you had polyamorous relationships. This then over time as society became more formalized and bureaucratized led to more monogamous relationships that were heterosexual monogamous relationships. However, if you look at sexuality through time, again, Alexander the Great was not a straight man, our greatest conqueror. You know, men having sex with the men at that time was completely normal. So was Alexander the Great or was Alexander the Great just sexual? Really interesting way to approach it. So again, depending on the time and epoch you're in, our attitudes towards sexuality, our sexual behaviors have changed over time. You know, the Spartans used to take little boys at a very young age take them into the woods for many years, keep them away from women. They would all engage in homosexual behavior. And then it was time to have a mate. The boys would come home with a mask on their head into their wife house. And then as soon as they procreated, then the man would go leave and go back into the woods again. Again, so when you look at sexuality, it's very different depending on where you are. Kings of England were marrying off their 12-year-old daughters, which would be incredibly taboo in modern times, for example. Uh, so homosexuality was acceptable at some times and unacceptable at other times. In the United States, homosexuality was a taboo until the 1970s. In 1973, they changed it to where being homosexual was no, was no longer labeled a psychological disorder. But up until 1973, if you said, I am gay in a classroom, they would have locked you in an institution. It was not good, okay? So the history of sexuality fluctuates over time. In modern times, you're starting to see this trend toward less intolerance, toward non-heterosexual identification, non-gender um, matching sex identification. Okay, so again, you're starting to see some changes and people are pushing the barriers. And not only are people extending beyond heterosexual and then homosexual, but then they're blending the two. There's a new term that's come out recently called heterocurious that I hadn't heard about. So sexual orientation categories, just like gender categories or social constructions, we're the ones who try to label and put boundaries to categories by which people identify with. And in modern times, people are jumping all over the place. They're trying out all kinds of things. They're having group relations. They're having monogamous relations. They're having same-sex relations. They're having bisexual relations. And it's becoming very broad. And so the categorization, these categories themselves are things that I like to question. Like what would happen if we didn't have sexual orientation categories? What would happen if people were just sexual? Would that open the door to freeing yourself from the limitations of identifying with the category? For example, when it comes to gender, once you identify as male, then you adopt the roles of the female and avoid or, um, of male, and then you avoid the roles of a female. So once you're socialized to think you're a male, you acquire the attributes of being masculine, which then structures your behavior in the way you think. Well, what if you never taught someone they were male or female and just let them be human? Would they then adopt the cultures of all worlds, you know? And so same thing with sexuality. If we didn't have these categories, would people be more open, for example? Um, so 
sexual violence is a thing we have to study in sociology. It's really dark, but again, if we're looking at social trends in the, and we're looking at the social world and we're studying social behavior, you know, one in 30 women, for example, one in five boys experience sexual violence. So um, it's a dark reality about human sexuality that lots of it's happy, some of it's violent, some of it can be very dark. Um, and so, you know, that's a tough subject there. So the biopsychosocial perspective of sexuality involves looking at biological factors such as what you're attracted to, your hormone levels, that feeling inside, your psychological factors such as your cognitions towards sexuality, what you think is acceptable, and then the social perspective of sexuality and that our sexuality is socially controlled by social actors in the social world and that, you know, they're the ones who you know, kind of structure our heterosexuality, for example, by being anti-homosexuality. So a lot of that prejudice that came about from being homosexual comes about with the structuring of behavior, for example. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, sexual orientation is defined as an attraction toward a specific sex. Um, but again, when you actually study the concept of sex, that itself is incredibly dynamic because I used to think there were two sexes, then I found out there were three sexes, and then now that I look deeper into intersex, I'm looking at hundreds of different ways by which the human body can, regarding gonads, genitalia, chromosomes, hormones, can be formed that I really have no idea how many sexes there are anymore, so even I am very confused by that, really what used to be a simple question of how many sexes are there. How many genders are there? You know, infinite genders. Essentially, I don't know if there's an infinite number of sexual orientation categories, but we have to have a lot just to be able to account for all human sexual behavior. Okay, but again, the categories themselves are social constructions. Like, we don't actually need those categories to be able to get around the world. But once you identify with these categories, then you identify with the attributes of the categories, and that then starts to structure your behavior, for example. Okay? We study the stigmatization of sexual minority groups in that in the class system, minority groups were oppressed, stuck in the lower classes, subjugated, negative ideologies were attached to this, then that is associated with the overall life chances of minority groups in that because people are stigmatized for not being heterosexual or for not identifying with the same gender as your assigned biological sex at birth, that then you know causes you to get stuck more often in poverty, have higher risk rates um, for drug abuse and mental health and physical health. Again, so the stigmatization of sexual minority groups is incredibly sad, but same with the stigmatization of females, same with the stigmatization of non-whites. It has an effect both, you know, sociologically in your access, psychologically in the way you think, and then biologically when it comes to things like your immune system being reduced. You might not think that stress caused from prejudice can reduce the immune system functioning, but it does, which then increases higher rates of heart disease and cancer, for example. Okay? We also study how sexual behavior is structured by culture, not only agents of culture, of agents of socialization, but also norms, values, ideologies about what's acceptable and what's not. Um, we look at sociocultural changes in acceptable sexual behavior. Again, how has things changed? Because again, back in the day, if a girl got pregnant and she wasn't married, that would have been incredibly taboo and might have caused an ostracization from society. Or if an African American and a white person got together, that would have caused maybe somebody would have got lynched in that kind of a situation historically. But nowadays, that you know, four out of ten women are having babies not being married. Interracial marriages went from four hundred thousand in nineteen eighty to ten million in modern times. Okay, when it comes to same sex relations, that's becoming more acceptable. But again, that depends on where you are. Like in the city, it's a lot easier to say I am gay than it is in a small rural town, for example. Um, so you're seeing some sociocultural changes happening right before our eyes, okay? The book talks about the sexual diversity of America. And again, this is um, subjected to whether or not people respond to surveys honestly. But the book says 7.3% of people have had a same-sex partner 
and then 3.7% have had one in the last month, and then 4.8% identify as bisexual or homosexual if you're looking at the sexual diversity of America. A new concept that's coming out is sexual fluidity. This is what my PhD is in, gender and sexual fluidity. And this is, again, the idea of sexuality ranging. And it can go, you can say that the range is between heterosexual and homosexual, but I like to think of the range of going in multiple directions, not even necessarily off of one axis. I don't really like to think about sexuality as somewhere between straight and non-straight. I like to think about straight, non-straight, poly, you know, bi, and then all these other, you know, so it's more like a balloon and, you know, <laughs> I gotta look at it like the universe, right? Or there's no real axes, like where's the center of the universe kind of thing. Okay, coming out process is incredibly tough. Um, as a sociologist, you want to say that the coming out process is not a natural stage of development. Because in nature, there is no such thing as the coming out process. There's just people being sexual, okay? But in a formalized society like ours, and in cultures in which heterosexuality is socialized, and non-heterosexuality was historically taboo. A phase of development was constructed for people that are non-heterosexual, and it's this idea of coming out of the closet. But again, to begin with, why is there a closet in the first place? Why would somebody feel like they couldn't, hide, they had to hide a part of their identity? And that's because to say I am gay out loud publicly, historically in America was incredibly dangerous for that person to say it. And just incredibly taboo and we would re result in a huge amount of social stigmatization. So the idea of the closet was formed as people had to hide their true selves, their true bio, biological self, okay? Because again, is being gay part of your biology? Yes. Yes, there's a genetic component to it for sure, okay? But the closet was created because they couldn't be themselves out in public, okay? So the closet itself is a social construction. People had to you know, create a closet, a way of hiding parts of their identity from other people out of fear, okay? But whether or not the closet itself is a natural phase of development, it is a phase of development because it's imposed upon and so the experience of being in the closet is incredibly real. And it often is involves, there's a couple of like Cass's and Fessinger's models for the coming out of the closet and the stages of sexual development talk about this. And they talk about how at first you could experience a lot of shame, then general curiosity, and then recognition of who you are, and then the public announcement, you know, of saying, hey, this is who I truly am. But again, why would somebody go through that? Because people's true selves are dying to come out, okay? And then we force people to have to hide who they really are out of fear of stigmatization. And so then they have to go through this whole process of learning able to cope with not matching social norms and things like that. But what I'm trying to say is why is there a closet at all? I mean, being sexual is normal, whether it's same sex or not same sex. Yes, we need rules against pedophilia, because humans will have sex with children. Yes, we need rules against rape and violence, because humans will do that too. But why do we need a rule about somebody just wanting to, a man wanting to have sex with another man, for example? Who does that actually hurt? And it's an overarching question that should be asked. And again, when you look at sexuality, you want to apply the theories. Why are there value systems that were historically heterosexual, you know, where do those come from? Does those value systems cause conflict, okay? And then how is sexuality and sexual orientation influenced by the interaction with you and other people? Okay, so a biological approach to sexuality. This is an incredibly complex, okay, because to do this, you really have to understand everything about the body, all about genes and genetics and all of the um, organs in your body, and it's just very complex, okay, I'm not going to lie. All right, so the body is involved in the most basic of sexuality. Think about when you're, like, excited about somebody. Do you feel it in your body, or is it just like a mind thing, like a cognition? You feel it in your body. 
So your body, when it wants sex or it's attracted to things, your endocrine system, your gonads, they release hormones which travel through your bloodstream, seep into the gray matter of your brain, and then your brain is able to interpret those chemical messengers. So, so much of you being attracted to somebody else, of your body's physical arousal for sexuality is a biological process. You cannot... <sighs> being gay is not completely a choice, for example. Being straight is not completely a choice. A lot of that is just your basic genetics built into you of what you're attracted to and what you're not attracted to. Some aspects of how we express our sexuality are a choice completely. We have some conscious control over this. But at the same time, your body is signaling when you're hungry. You don't like tell your body, hey body, are you hungry? Why don't you let me know? Your body tells your brain you're hungry. Your body tells your brain you're cold. Your body tells your brain that you want sex. And so much of this is completely out of your control, okay? And then when it comes to actual sexual development, you have, you know, when you look at sexual development, it's super complex. And again, there's a reason that humans have divided into males and females, and that has to do with creating diverse genes. But within going into males and females, humans also divide into intersex. And why do intersex exist in our genetics? It could be that if all females in the world were susceptible to... Sorry, one second, I just wanted to make sure. Okay, we're good. <laughs> Had a fear that it wasn't recording. <laughs> it could be that if all females in the world were wiped out by some disease, somebody that is intersex, for example, they're the ones who are still can survive and still can reproduce. So even that's built into our sexuality. And then which direction does someone who's intersex go? Are they more likely to pick one or the other? Females, males, which direction do they go? Because of their biology and anatomy, are they more likely to pick one or the other? How much of being female is based upon your attraction to being male primarily and somewhat female? Why are females more likely to engage in same sex than males? A lot of that has to do with evolutionary psychology and evolutionary adaptations. Okay, because, you know, sex reduces conflict between groups. Sex has brain rewards. Sex creates bonds by releasing neurotransmitters like oxytocin. There's a reason that that's built into our communities and built into our biology to engage in same-sex behavior, if only to reduce stress and fire off brain rewards. But there's a lot of things involved. Again, your gonads releasing hormones, your genitalia, which are formed based upon the sex hormones that are released by the gonads, your chromosomes, which tell your gonads to form and how to form, uh, the hormones that are chemical messengers traveling through your bloodstream, and then your overall genetics that's been passed down for you know millennia throughout human evolution, okay? All of these are associated with your sexual attraction to asex, multiple sexes, two sexes, whatever it might be, okay? Now, rape is also built into human genetics. And this was a tough lecture that when I first heard it, it was a Yale professor talking about how using sexual violence is one way to make babies, but so is cohabitating and having monogamous relationships, etc. So, Rape is part of humanity. And again, this is why you need the social context. You need rules and social controls to be able to protect people from the biological animals that humans are. Okay? Same thing with having sex with children. You know, humans will do that. Same thing with incest. Okay? Humans will have sex with people in their family. That, that creates huge genetic problems, though. Okay? So... We need the social context to be able to structure a lot of the sexuality in order for other people to get along. Birth control, how does that affect the body? Again, I'm not a medical doctor to talk about it, but again, you know, how does that affect your eggs and getting pregnant, things along those lines for females and then for males also. Um, sexual dysfunctions, and another thing we can look at erectile dysfunction, dysfunctions and orgasm disorders and all kinds of stuff when it comes to sexual dysfunctions. Also, um, yeah, so there's a lot to the whole biological thing. Again, we probably need a medical doctor to go deeper, but we're already 20 minutes in. I won't bore you anymore with that. But again, to ask the question, do all people have non-heterosexual tendencies? Think about it. I mean, 
most people won't tell you, but they probably engage in some kind of same-sex behavior, especially during like the times of puberty when people are curious, but yet we're still divided into males and females. And this goes out throughout the entire lifespan. So again, I question that 7% number and kind of wonder if it's a lot higher. It's just that people may not report that kind of thing. But again, in everyone's genetics is this ability to just, you know, be sexual one day and want some sex and to hook up with something, whether it's yourself or whether it's just, an, you know, someone of the same sex or whether it's someone of a different sex. But think about it. You know, why do rates in prisons go up, you know? Is it because they're all gay or is it just because they want to engage in same-sex relations because maybe they're just amorous that day? And so, again, you have to ask the question of whether or not all people have it in your genes to be gay. But again, don't all humans have it in us to kill? I mean, think about how many wars that we've had. One in three women are raped. One in five boys. One in four girls are physically assaulted. One in five boys are physically assaulted. So guys, humans have it in us to rape, kill, hurt. So it makes you wonder, OK? So yes, the answer is yes, we all have it in us, but that social context is what a lot structures a lot of this behavior, which we really need some social control. From a psychological perspective, you have to be considering people's cognitions and the way they think, their emotions and how they feel, their motivations and their drives, those inner drives, including their sexual drives, okay? How they perceive reality and how they perceive what's acceptable social behavior. But again, sexuality is an unconscious and a conscious process. It's your unconscious mind that's communicating with your body. It's your unconscious mind that's like, all of a sudden your body's sending some hormones and your unconscious mind is like, man, why am I thinking about sex all of a sudden? And then your conscious mind kicks in like, I'm thinking about sex, what should I do about that? Hey, there's someone over there, maybe I'll go introduce myself and see if they wanna have coffee. Okay, psychologists definitely are studying sexual dysfunctions and also sexual uh, and just general disorders, again, like pedophilia and zoophilia, things along those lines. Um, your brain is, though, that's what's responding to and interpreting the body's signals. Your body's releasing hormones, and your brain interprets those neurotransmitters to make sense of how your body's feeling. And then based upon how your body's feeling, your unconscious mind sends that information to your conscious mind to reflect upon how your body's feeling and make some decisions about what you want to do. And some decisions are conscious and some are not. Your brain has awesome reward systems built in for sexuality. So you have brain rewards that you get from hookups. You have brain rewards from long-term relationships. But after doing the studies, and this is what I thought was really interesting, it turns out people that are in monogamous long-term relationships, they're the ones who experience the most brain rewards. But why? What do you get out of a relationship with somebody over a lifetime that your brain would be rewarding for? you for and again how much support are you getting in love and comfort and all your other attachment needs are being fulfilled along with your sexuality needs and having a partner to work to get food and things like that so it is built into us to have both monogamous non-monogamous long short hetero non-hetero all kinds of things are built into our bodies and our brains. We are capable of pretty much anything when it comes to sexuality. But again, what's acceptable is then culturally defined. So then sociology is going to talk about how our sexual behavior and our cognitions are structured by society. Again, because agents of socialization, they're the ones who are dictating you know, what is acceptable with, with sexuality and what's not. And then through forms of social control, whether it be legal or institutional, or it's just general mores that are being violated and people are just talking amongst themselves, so much of what you think is acceptable with sexuality was socialized by other people. Are your attitudes towards sexuality your own or are they influenced by the ideologies of others? Things to talk about, okay? But social norms are socially constructed. They're culturally constructed. People got together, decided what's acceptable about what's sexuality and what's not. What's acceptable about sexuality um, and when it comes to starting a family? Like historically, were you supposed to like get married and start a family before you have sex or how does that work, you know? But the categories themselves of sexuality are also sexually, socially constructed. We're the ones who decided up these categories like heterosexual, bisexual, homosexual, and then all the new ones that are coming out that I can't even list because there's so many of them these days. 
we look at deviance and we say, all right, look, what happens when you deviate from cultural norms? What happens when you violate these cultural norms about sexuality and what should be the sanctions? Okay, so in modern times, hopefully we're getting to the point where we don't sanction anymore for people engaging in same-sex behavior or polyamorous. I mean, we do have laws against you know, having more than one spouse. But again, there's no law against like the, the group law, which is becoming just much more popular in modern times. Even if you, know, we, you can't relate to that, it's still the trend that's happening. So, but the, what's culturally deviant and what's not is, you know, highly influenced by which time frame we're in, which epoch we're in. Are we in the 1960s? Or are we in modern times? Okay, because that is totally associated with what's acceptable and what's not. But we need the sanctions for deviating from some social norms like pedophilia, rape, and sexual violence. Now, those are the more, I, mean, I don't ever really tell my own personal opinion, but I'm really glad we have laws that against having sex with children, against rape, and against violence. Um, I want that social control in my own society because, I don't know, it just seems like it's a lot safer. <laughs> now, again, I, I don't really have an opinion on much, but I, I don't understand why history, they were like anti-being gay. It makes no sense to me. Um, that's just, you know, a side note. All right, when it comes to sexual norms, not only do we have cultural rules that are enforced and changed with epochs, um, but you also have different standards for groups, like, and that also changed. Like back in the day, both boys and girls, males and females and intersex, were all encouraged just to have one partner. And then somewhere along the line, males were encouraged to have dozens of partners, and women just still have one. And what happens when a man's only had sex with one person? Do people make fun of him? And then what happens if a girl's had sex with more than one person? Do they make fun of her? Do they stigmatize you? And so a lot of my classes use words that I'm not going to say here, um, but there is some shaming involved. Okay, so we have different standards for males and females. Now, why do we have different standards? Again, it's a biopsychosocial thing. Because males can have multiple babies, right? And women can only have like 10 to 14 babies in a lifetime, for example. And so maybe women are more selective and males are not selective. And maybe that's built into your biology or maybe that's all crap. Okay? Um, psychological factors, you know, of the shaming and the, you know, how do you feel about yourself when you do this? And then social factors of cultural norms being different depending on where you are. We also are going to study sexual diseases. It's very important that we study that in society. We look at rates of sexual violence, pornography, sex trafficking, uh, rights of women and um, others when it comes to sexuality. Uh, we study relationship types that are existing in the social context. Again, monogamous heterosexuality was the norm forever, but now that's changed. Uh, polygamy, as the book said, was like the OG of types of relationships and family types in you know early history, and then polyamory being with multiple people. Uh, social interaction, we study how the behavior of different people when it comes to sexual behavior. We look at how uh, society is educated regarding sexuality, especially when it comes to spreading awareness about sexual diseases and pregnancy. And then institutionalizing families to justify sexual activity. You know, in the family, you know, we used to encourage people to get married because to avoid all of these social cultural shaming. And so having sex before marriage was historically taboo. And is that still today? I mean, most couples live together in modern times. They didn't do that back in the day. Okay. So a lifespan approach, again, is looking at a biopsychosocial explanation for sexuality, sexual development, sexual behavior, looking at sexuality at different stages or phases in the lifespan, looking at fertility and then the ages of which people have babies. You're starting to see a huge decline in fertility and a raise in the ages that people have babies. Um, we look at sexuality and health for teens and all groups. Your book definitely highly focuses on adolescence, though, and the importance of talking about things like teen pregnancy and spreading awareness. Um, looking at sexuality and demography, again, population studies for fertility rates, sexual encounter rates, sexual orientation rates. Um, looking at sexuality and having a child in stressful circumstances, again, being a single parent, living in poverty, how is that associated with having a child and not being married? Um, so there's a lot to this chapter. This is just an introduction to all these factors of your identity, which then are associated with the family in the end. Because again, how is sexual orientation, for example, associated with the family, for example? 
you know, and that's a huge topic because historically, you know, two males were not allowed to start families, and now that's becoming incredibly common. And so there's this great changes that have occurred. And how is, uh, like, women having babies without being married, for example? How is that associated with likelihood of poverty and the well-being of the children? Is there an association? You know, there's just so many areas we could go here. But again, we're just kind of setting up the all these factors that play into the gender roles of families, the types of families, how families are structured, factors that affect the families, uh, things that threaten the families. So, good setup. Have a wonderful day.